uh, just last week. But she's going to be remembered, and as I said, she changed so many lives in this country, so many lives for the better. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Iowa. Uh, I thank uh, my colleague from Iowa for his uh, very nice remarks about Katie Beckett. Obviously, I come to the floor for the same reason, uh, to celebrate the life of Katie Beckett. Uh, never has the word inspiration been used more appropriately in describing somebody, and today I'm grateful to be able to recognize the inspirational life of Katie Beckett. Mary, Mary Catherine, nicknamed Katie Beckett, was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, March the 9th, 1978. Five months after she was born, Katie contracted viral encephalitis, followed by grand mal seizures. The encephalitis caused damage to her central nervous system and her respiratory system, and she was attached to a ventilator. She would be almost two years old before she could breathe on her own. Under Medicaid law at the time, as Senator Harkin said, Katie could only receive care through Medicaid if she remained in the hospital, even though she was able to receive the care at home. Iowa Congressman Tom Talkey heard of Katie's situation and realized that it made no sense to keep a child in the hospital who could be at home with her family. Better quality of life, as well as saving the taxpayers money. Uh, Congressman Talkey worked to convince the administration that the system should be changed to allow states to provide Medicaid to children receiving care in their homes. Ultimately, President Reagan took up Katie's cause, intervening so that Katie could receive treatment at home and still be covered under Medicaid. This change in policy became known as the Katie Becky waivers, and to date, more than a half a million disabled children have been able to receive care in their home with their families rather than being forced into hospitals and institutions. But Katie's story doesn't end there. As Katie grew up, as she battled to establish her own place in society as a young American with disabilities, she, she realized she had an opportunity to serve others who faced similar challenges. In her own words, and this is from a piece Katie wrote in the year 2002, titled, quote, Whatever Happened to Katie Beckett, end of the title. So I quote, I started my advocacy career at age 10. It was not my choice, but rather a path chosen for me. It was not until I was 12 or 13 that I realized the important work I was able to do because I was who I was and how much this work helped other kids. End of quote. Katie graduated with a degree in English from Mount Mercy College in Cedar Rapids. She lived in the community. She wanted to be a teacher and write novels for young people. She was fiercely independent, sometimes to the consternation of her mother, Julie. She was quick-witted and funny and loved a good cup of coffee. She lived her life as a tireless advocate for the disabled. She testified before Congress several times and was contributing voice on numerous groups dedicated to disability policy. When we took up policy proposals like Family Opportunity Act and Money Follows the Person, we wanted Katie's perspective and we depended upon her advocacy in the community to get those laws passed. Katie was the living embodiment of a person with disabilities participating and contributing in society. Mr. President, on Friday, May 18th, Katie went home to be with the Lord. She leaves behind thousands of lives touched by her presence. A light may go out, but a light lives on in those of us fortunate enough to have known Katie Beckett. We remain inspired to work every day to create opportunities for the disabled, to participate and contribute and live the life of service and dedication that Katie did. So obviously, even though not alive today, Katie will remain that inspiration for many people 
for a long time to come. Thank you very much. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from North Carolina. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to uh, speak as if in morning business, please. Without objection. Mr. President, I think I can say I was blessed to be here right before the tribute to Katie that our colleagues from Iowa gave. What an inspiring young lady's life. Though cut short, uh, her impact is felt by many. Mr. President, I rise today to speak on a bill that I introduced last week, S-3084, the Veterans Integrated Service Network Reorgan Reorganization Act of 2012. This legislation would significantly reorganize the structure of the Departments of Veterans Affairs, or VA, in their Veterans Integrated Service Networks, or VISNs, to make these networks more efficient and to allow resources to be moved to direct patient care. The veterans' health care system in our country was originally established to treat combat-related injuries and to assist in the recovery of veterans with service-connected disabilities. Since its start, the scope of Veterans Health Administration, or VHA, has expanded and now treats all veterans enrolled in the health care system through hundreds of medical facilities located around the country. Prior to 1995, VHA was organized into four regional offices. These regional offices simply channeled information between the medical centers and the VA's Washington, D.C. headquarters office. Since the regional office's duties were to pass on information to the facilities, they had little ability to exercise independence in implementing policies based on the need of the veterans in their regions. So in March 1995, based upon the recommendation of former Undersecretary of Health, uh, Dr. Kenneth Kaiser, VA underwent a significant reorganization of its Washington, D.C. and regional offices. Basically, the VHA health care system was divided up into 22 geographic areas, now 21, with each region having its own headquarters with a limited management structure to support the medical facilities in that region. The goal of the reorganization was to improve access to, quality of, and the efficiency of care to veterans through, and I quote, patient first, unquote, focus. <clears throat> this structure would improve care by empowering visions with the independence to decide how to best provide for the veterans in their region. This change also would have made it the, the most of spending for patient care by suggesting that vision management be located on a VA medical center campus. The aim was to provide better organized system that would have oversight management responsibilities of the medical facilities through a new structure called the Veterans Integrated Service Network. This new system intended to offer a clearer picture of what the duties were of both VA Central Office and VISN Headquarters. Going forward, VHA Central Office responsibilities included changes to VA policy and medical procedures and monitoring the facility's performance in providing care. Each VISN Headquarters primary function was to be the basic budgetary management and planning units for its network of medical facilities. Because the scope of their task was limited, it was expected that a VISN headquarters could be operated with seven to ten full-time employees for a total of 220 staff for all VISN headquarters nationally. Any additional expertise needed was to be called up from the medical centers on an informal basis. But I believe the VHA has significantly strayed from the initial concept behind the 1995 reorganization. While some growth and an increase in VISN management staff over 17 years is expected, the growth and duplication of duties we've seen at VISN headquarters, offices, and medical facilities quite simply is troubling. Examples of such duplication are coordinators for homeless veterans, OIF, OEF, and OND, veterans, women veterans, that are present at both the medical facilities and the VISN headquarters. This duplication has not only redirected spending away from medical centers, it's caused a bloating of the numbers of staff across the 21 VISN headquarters. VISN headquarters have grown well beyond the 220 staff proposed by the 1995 reorganization to a total of 1,300 
and 40 staff for 21 Vision headquarters today, an increase from 220 to 1,340 employees today. These staff are performing functions that have little to do with budget, management, and oversight, let alone direct health care for our veterans. It appears the VHA has allowed Vision headquarters staff to increase without the necessary oversight of, a, of an assessment of the impact on the original purpose for visits. Also left unchecked are the changes in the veterans population and how veterans have moved between states to determine if there is a need to adjust the visit boundaries to best serve the veterans seeking care. This bill, my bill, would bring about a much needed change to the visit structure. It would, one, consolidate the boundaries into nine visits. Two, move some jobs back into the VA central office. Three, reduce the number of employees to 65 per vision. And four, require VHA to review the vision, vision staff and structure every three years. What a novel suggestion that we would actually review the progress that we make. My colleagues may find it a bit odd that we could reduce the staff of Vision headquarters while also increasing the size of a veteran's population and facilities from some Vision headquarters. <coughs> Excuse me. But because we're reducing what the tasks that the Vision headquarters perform in transferring several jobs to new regional support centers or RSCs, Vision headquarters staffs would be more productive in carrying out the simple budget, management, and planning duties that they were originally tasked with in 1995 in the reorganization. While the consolidation of visions would result in the closure of nine vision headquarters, no staff would lose their job as a result of this legislation. Staff whose jobs would be eliminated because of the consolidation would have a chance to be transferred to other positions within the VA. Staff who perform the oversight functions that would be moved to the newly created RSC would be given the opportunity to continue to work at the RSC. This legislation also returns the idea that Vision headquarters should be located on VA campuses by directing that Vision headquarters, if possible, be located on a VA medical center campus. Relocating to vacant space on a VA medical center camp campus hopefully would reduce the cost to VA in the long run but more importantly, it would bring the headquarters staff closer to the facilities they oversee. Mr. President, I realize this would be an enormous change in the way VHS does business. Yet I believe that this can be accomplished without any changes to how VA provides treatment and care to our nation's veterans. In fact, I believe it will improve how VA cares for veterans by increasing the resources directly available for patient care. It's important that VA not lose sight of its primary mission as stated by Abraham Lincoln, and I quote, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, unquote. And to that end, VA should redirect spending away from bureaucrats and back to the direct care of veterans. I believe the Vision Reorganization Act of 2012 would provide a more efficient and effective health care system to our veterans. And I hope my colleagues will see it in that light and support this effort at reorganization that is way past due. I thank the chair. I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaga.
Mr. President. The Senator from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd ask the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I came to the floor tonight, and I'm going to relieve you in a few minutes, so I promise I won't go on uh, for very long, uh, to talk about uh, the FDA reauthorization bill that's before the Senate. I was sorry that we couldn't get it to a vote today. I'm hopeful that tomorrow we will be able to, because from my perspective, uh, as someone who has only been here for a few years, uh, the process, the committee process that led uh, to the creation of this bill, I think is a model for how this town ought to be working. The conversation we've had here for, oh, so many months and even years has felt decoupled from the conversations I've been having in my town hall meetings and across the country about the challenges that we need to address. This gap has been miles apart, but I think in this piece of legislation we've actually found something responsive to patients, responsive to consumers, and responsive to the bioscience industry that's so important to my state and so many states across the country. Chairman Harkin and Ranking Member Enzi deserve enormous credit for running an excellent process that's enabled this senator, and I think others on the committee, to be responsive to what our constituents say they want, which is a modern FDA with improved patient safety and innovation. We've also had committee members that are, were interested in rolling up their sleeves and doing hard work together, irrespective of which party that they were in. And we've been able to work through a markup with virtually no partisanship. This has been a uniquely fine process which is why we've had such great momentum toward a full extension and in what I call the land of flickering lights because the standard of success around here has become keep it, the government running for one more month, keep this extension in place for two more uh, months. We actually have on the floor a r rational and responsible bill that's a five-year extension of the Food and Drug Administration authority. Uh, tonight I only want to talk about two aspects of the bill. There are a number that we worked on, uh, but tonight i spare you with the rest because I have to replace the presiding officer. In 2010, I introduced a bill called the Drug Safety and Accountability Act. Chairman Harkin and uh, Ranking Member Enzi took notice, and we were able to form a working group to address serious problems in the FDA's statutory authority. FDA laws that are supposed to protect our domestic drug supply were created in 1938 and desperately needed to be updated for the 21st century. Back then, the lines of commerce were based on 48 states. Now we live in an era where over 80 percent of the active ingredients in our, pharmaceutical, uh, in our pharmaceuticals and our drug supply are being manufactured abroad. Couple that with the FDA laws that force them to inspect American facilities every two years but have no mandate on how often they inspect facilities overseas. The GAO, the Government Accounting Office, has found that FDA could only keep pace with inspecting the most high-risk overseas facilities, the places where our moms and dads are getting the pharmaceuticals for our children once every nine years. Once every nine years. So patients taking their pills have no idea whether the ingredients in their drug were made in China or India, or if they were ever inspected. Our American manufacturers are operating on an uneven playing field. They have to expect a surprise FDA inspection every two years on average here and make sure they're following all their good manufacturing practices when their foreign counterparts don't have to worry about FDA visiting them for a decade, if ever, and they, because they can delay or refuse FDA inspections because they're overseas. Patients groups and the industry came together to try to change that, and this bill does change all of that. It would implement a risk-based inspection schedule for both foreign and domestic manufacturing sites. It would make sure that drug manufacturers know who's in their supply chain every step of the way. And for the first time, if you're abroad and you refuse or delay inspection without a fair reason, the FDA can refuse to let your product in this country. These are all the steps American families already think we have in place to protect them. I can't tell you how many town halls I've had where people have been shocked to learn that the products that they have in their medicine cabinets have never been inspected by anybody. 
This will change that, and it's a thoughtful, common sense approach that I think uh, all of the constituents to this debate support. So we need to make sure that happens. I also want to talk about something uh, called track and trace. American families also want to know what happens to their pills, pills that can mean the difference between life and death. Once they leave the manufacturer, enter the country uh, and change hands several times. Right now we can know a lot more from a barcode on a gallon of milk than from a barcode on medications. And that seems absurd to people at home. And I want to take a moment again here to thank the chair and ranking member for their commitment to working together to meet the challenge of, de of developing a uniform traceability system. This is something that has been worked on for over a decade in this town, and we are finally this close to making it uh, the law of the land. And I want to thank in particular my colleague Richard Burr, a Republican from North Carolina, for being such a great partner uh, in this work. FDA, the HELP Committee staff, Pew and other stakeholders across the supply chain have been meeting for weeks with my staff and with Senator Burr's staff, all in good faith. And our goal is to finalize a plan after we wrap up the Senate bill. And since I see that I, there's no one else on the floor and I have a few more minutes, let me talk about another very exciting part. Oh, oh sorry, my colleague from New Hampshire is here, so I'm going to yield to her. But I will tell you that if we pass this bill, for the first time, the FDA is going to be able to apply 21st century science to the approval of drugs, particularly drugs that are breakthrough medications, drugs that we know will work in one set, subset of population, even if they might not work so well in another. This is very important to cancer patients all across the United States who are looking to access these breakthrough therapies. So from the standpoint of driving uh, a, an industry in this country that in my own state has a median uh, salary of roughly $74,000. And for the point of view of patient health and protecting our supply chain, uh, this FDA reauthorization is a must pass. I thank the members of the committee and especially the chairman and the ranking member uh, for, for establishing a model, really, for how this Senate should operate. And with that, I yield the floor to, our, to the Senator from New Hampshire. And I thank her for her patience. Mr. President. The Senator from New Hampshire. Mr. President, I ask um, consent to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Um, before I do, I should say that I applaud my colleague from Colorado, Senator Bennett, for the work that he's done on this FDA legislation. And as he pointed out, the good work that's been done by our colleagues on both sides of the aisle to get this bill to move it forward and to um, have a responsible and reasonable amendment process. So I hope that we can move it forward this week and actually see its passage on the floor because it is so important to so many people who are dependent on what the F Food and Drug Administration does in this country. Um, but Mr. President, I actually came to the floor to speak on another topic this afternoon. Um, this week, we celebrate National Small Business Week. Small businesses are so important to job creation in this country. So much of the innovation that takes place in this country happens as the result of the work of small businesses. Two-thirds of the jobs that we expect to be created to lead us out of the recession and through this recovery are going to be created by small businesses. And it's important that here in this chamber we do everything we can to support small businesses. I'm pleased that I've been able to be a member of the Small Business Committee and I applaud the leadership of Senator Landrieu and Senator Snow, um, the chair and ranking member, for all of the good work they've done to support small business. Um, I can tell you from my own personal experience just how important small businesses are. My husband and I started our married life um, and for eight years ran a family business. It put us both through graduate school. It gave us a down payment on a house. It employed a number of young people for eight years. And um, I understand it taught me a lot about meeting a payroll and um, making sure that we can um, take care of our employees, help make sure that they have good jobs, and 
Um, so I've had that personal experience to make me understand just how critical small businesses are to our economy. Um, I also want to I'm here on the floor also to talk about bipartisan legislation that my colleague from New Hampshire, Senator Ayotte, and I are introducing today to boost small business exports. Um, just as small businesses are the backbone of so much of this country's economy, they are clearly the backbone of New Hampshire's economy. It should come as no surprise to um, all of our constituents in New Hampshire that both Senator Ayotte and I serve on the Small Business Committee because we know just how important those businesses are to our state. We both recognize how critical it is for us as a delegation to work across the aisle and across chambers when possible to help the small businesses in New Hampshire provide the good jobs that the residents of New Hampshire need. So I'm glad that Senator Ayotte and I are working together to introduce legislation to help remove barriers to exporting for small businesses in New Hampshire and across the United States. The bill we're introducing today, the Small Business Export Growth Act, is the result of a Small Business Committee field hearing that we hosted together in Manchester, New Hampshire last August. And we held that hearing because we recognize that exports offer a tremendous opportunity for small businesses. Unfortunately, for so many small businesses, those foreign markets have remained an untapped resource for most of them. Over 95% of the world's customers live outside of the United States, but only 1% of our small businesses export. That's a particularly shocking number when you compare it to large businesses because over 40% of large businesses sell their products overseas. So we've got to do more to help our small businesses get into those international markets. At our field hearing, we heard about some of the barriers that our small businesses face when they try to go global. And our legislation is an attempt to remove some of those barriers so that small businesses can access new sources of revenue and create jobs. One of the problems we heard about is that navigating the federal bureaucracy can be a special challenge for small businesses that wish to export. I know that the President and I can both appreciate that because we know how hard it is for us to navigate the federal bureaucracy. Senator Ayotte and I heard from two such New Hampshire companies that rely on state and federal offices to help them export. And I want to talk about one of those companies specifically. It's a company that's called SecureCare. SecureCare has developed a technology that protects Alzheimer's patients who may wander away from their home or their place of residence. And it also protects newborns who are still in maternity wards. Grace Preston, who is the international sales manager for SecureCare, told us that the company has significantly expanded its growth by selling overseas. Grace also told us that Secure Care couldn't have done that without federal and state export programs working together. In New Hampshire, we're very fortunate because our state and federal export services work seamlessly. And that's been really important in helping our businesses grow their exports. In 2010, New Hampshire's exports grew about 40 percent. That was almost twice the national average and the most of any state in the country. So it's been very critical to our small businesses. But we also heard that state and federal agencies don't always have that same collaborative relationship in other places across the country. According to our former New Hampshire trade director, Don Wivel, these services sometimes in some places can overlap, or even worse, sometimes there are agencies who refuse to work together. Our bill attempts to require better coordination to make more successes like Secure Care a reality across the country. Our bill also encourages the federal government to do more to promote the opportunity of exporting and to get the word out about federal export programs. Mr. President, Foreign markets can be daunting for small businesses, but that shouldn't stop our innovators from trying to compete. 
our small businesses must be assured that the federal government will help them when considering exporting. That part of our responsibility is to try and do everything we can to put in place policies that help small businesses when they want to try and export. So I want to thank Senator Ayotte um, for her cooperation, for the work that we've done together, both Senator Ayotte and her staff, along with my staff, for working on this issue. I look forward to advancing this legislation in the Senate and to continuing to recognize the important role that small businesses play in our economy. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
senator from Ohio. Thank you. I um, ask for unanimous consent to dispense with a quorum call. Without objection. And, Mr. President, I ask for unanimous consent to address the House as if in morning business for no more than 10 minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, last week, the Vice President of the United States was in my state, in Ohio, in Mahoning Valley, in the Youngstown area, in Northeast Ohio, and he saw what I've been seeing in my state for the last several months, and he heard what I've been hearing from so many Ohioans in the last several months. Uh, he went to the Lordstown Auto Assembly Plant, which makes the Chevy, which assembles the Chevy Cruze, uh, and he saw what we've been seeing in my state where manufacturing finally is coming back. From 2000 to 2010, uh, from, from early 2000 to January 2010, about a 10-year period, the manufacturing sector in this country lost a huge number of jobs, more than 5 million jobs. Now, the 30, the, about the 35 years before that, Manufacturing jobs in this country were pretty constant. They were up and, up and down, but in 1997 or 8, we had about the same number of manufacturing jobs in America that we had in 1965. A smaller percent of the workforce, a smaller percent of GDP, perhaps, but roughly the same number of jobs. But from, Jan from 2010, 2000 to January 2010, we lost some estimates were as high as one-third of our manufacturing jobs. We know it was at least 5 million jobs and some 60,000 plant closings in that 10-year period from 2000 to 2010. It's almost impossible to ascribe that, uh, at least in part, to, it's, 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 it's certain to be able to ascribe, ascribe that, at least in part, is trade policy and tax policy. Tax policy that far too often gives manufacturing companies uh, an incentive to shut down and move overseas. If you shut down a plant in Warren, Ohio, or Mansfield, Ohio, or Springfield, Ohio, and move to Wuhan or Xi'an or Shanghai, you can deduct the moving expenses and save on your federal taxes. And it's hard to do anything but ascribe, at least in part, uh, some of the trade agreements we've signed, NAFTA, that the president has pushed through Congress in both parties, and I was just as critical of President Clinton for NAFTA as I was President Bush on CAFTA, and what that's meant, the Central American Free Trade Agreement and the North American Free Trade Agreement. We know what PNTR with China did, where we went from a, about a not much more than $10 billion trade deficit in 2000 to trade deficits that were, were uh, 15, 20 billion, I believe 10 to 15 billion dollars a month with China um, later in the decade. But we, and, we, and we know from the policy of tax cuts that went overwhelmingly to the wealthiest Americans that passed in 2001 and 2003, uh, going into two wars and not paying for it, a Medicare drug law that, that in the name of privatization, basically, gave away huge incentives to the drug and insurance companies. All that played into an economic policy that, that, that didn't work for the American people. More than 5 million lost manufacturing jobs, 60,000 plant closings between 2000 and 2010. Well, what happened in 2009 and 2010 to finally turn that around is in the House and Senate and the President of the United States, uh, rescued the auto industry. We know the kind of job loss we are seeing, and now, now look what we have. It's not it's not great yet. We've, we're not seeing huge growth in manufacturing. But almost every single month since early 2010, in Ohio and across the country, we're seeing job growth in manufacturing. So far since early 2010, after that 5 million job manufacturing job loss from early 2000 to early 2010, five, more than 5 million manufacturing jobs lost, we've seen 400 plus thousand net job increase in these two plus years since then. That's again, it's, it's too anemic, it's not enough, but it's the direction we need to go. And let me give you a couple of examples how, what, what this has meant and why the auto rescue meant so much to my state and why it's meant so much to the United States of America. The Jeep Wrangler and the Jeep uh, Liberty assembled in Toledo, Ohio. Prior to the auto rescue, uh, these workers assembled these cars, these, these, um, the, the, the Wrangler and the Liberty, assembled them with only 50% American-made components. After the auto rescue today, about 75% of the components that go into the Wrangler and go into the Jeep Liberty assembled in Toledo, Ohio, come from products 
come from components made in the United States of America. And look at what's happened in Lordstown, Ohio. The engine is made in Defiance, Ohio. The bumper comes from Northwood, Ohio. The transmission comes from Toledo, Ohio. The speaker system comes from Springboro, Ohio. The steel comes from Cleveland and Middletown, Ohio. The aluminum comes from Cleveland, Ohio. The stamping is in Parma, Ohio. And this is put together. This, all these parts come together in Lordstown, Ohio, near Youngstown, assembled by 5,000 workers on three shifts. Almost none of that would have happened without the auto rescue. And you know what else the auto rescue was all about? It didn't just help Chrysler and GM, which had in fact gone into bankruptcy. It also was supported, the auto rescue was supported by Ford and supported by Honda in my state. We have huge Ford and Honda investments in my state. Why would they have supported the auto rescue when the support from the government the loans from the government, if you will, went to Chrysler and GM, not to Ford and Honda, because they knew the importance of the supply chain. Because the supply chain for Chrysler and GM had collapsed, as it would have if those two companies had gone into bankruptcy and not been restructured and financed so they could come out of bankruptcy. If that had happened, then the supply chain for Ford and Honda also would have partially collapsed. We see that evidence, the evidence of that, and what happened in the with, uh, with the tsunami in Japan where Honda and others had to shut down for a period of time because they couldn't get the supply chain, they, they, they couldn't get the supplies, components manufactured, that they needed some of them from Japan. So the point is, Mr. President, that we, we stepped in with the auto rescue, not just for, for Chrysler and GM, not just for Honda and Ford. In my state were 800,000 jobs it's officially estimated, are, are, have, are affiliated with the auto industry. But it also meant these jobs in Tier 1 suppliers. Tier 1 suppliers, some of them were about to collapse. Um, we, the, the rescue of the auto industry also directly helped to rescue some of those Tier 1 suppliers. I've seen those Tier 1 suppliers. Magnum in a suburb of Toledo. Um, I've been there. Johnson Controls, which makes seats. In Warren, Ohio, which makes seats for the Chevy Cruze. I, I, I mentioned, left that one out. All of those Tier 1 suppliers were in trouble. We also knew that the Tier 2, 3, 4 suppliers for the auto industry, making components you might not recognize if you held them in your hands, what they exactly were, but that go into the, go into the Chrysler and the Ford and the GM and the Honda. In those, um, those those tier two, three, four supply chain, tier, tier two, three, four companies in the, in the auto supply chain were not able to get financing in many times, and we helped through the auto rescue to do that. So the, the point, Mr. President, is what Vice President Biden saw in Youngstown, in Lordstown, Ohio, what I hear in Dayton and Columbus and Mansfield and in Toledo and Rossford and Parma all over my state. When I hear these workers saying they understand that this auto rescue where the government invested, these companies are paying, paying these investments back, but the government invested because nobody else would have. It saved all these jobs. It's why manufacturing is beginning to turn around. There are other factors, of course. In our, in one of them is the President of the United States is, is enforcing trade law. We see a new steel mill in Youngstown. Um, in part because the president, in, the president stood up to the Chinese and forced trade law when the Chinese were gaming the system on something called oil country tubular steel used in, in, in drilling for oil and used in drilling for natural gas. All of that has mattered to this manufacturing job growth. We're not there yet. We need the administration to step up on a real policy for manufacturing, a real strategy. I think they're starting to do that on better tax law, better trade law, better enforcement of trade laws, on assisting manufacturing when we can partner with them, not picking winners and losers, but understanding that manufacturing, to create wealth, you either grow it, you mine it, or you make it. My state does all three, does all three very well. We'll continue to with this kind of partnership as we move forward. Mr. President, I, I um, suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Senator from Ohio. Ask me as sent to dispense with the quorum. Without objection. Mr. President, ask me as sent the Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. I understand there are two bills at the desk. I ask for their first reading in block. The, the clerk will read the title of the bills for the first time. S-3220, a bill to amend the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 to provide more effective remedies to victims of discrimination in the payment of wages on the basis of sex and for other purposes. S-3221, a bill to amend the National Labor Relations Act to permit employers to pay higher wages to their employees. Mr. President, I, Mr. President, I ask for a second reading in block. I object to my own request in block. Objection having been heard. The, the bills will be read for the second time on the next legislative day. Mr. President, I ask you to consent that when the Senate adjourns, completes its business today, the Senate adjourn until 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday, May 23rd, that following the prayer and pledge, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, the morning hour be deemed expired, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. The majority leader be recognized that the first hour following the remarks of majority leader and Republican leader be equally divided and controlled between the two sides, with Republicans controlling the first half and the majority controlling the final half. Further, that the majority control the time from 1 p.m. until 2 p.m. Without objection. It's the majority leader's intention to resume consideration of S-3187, the FDA user fees bill when the Senate convenes tomorrow. We're working on an agreement for amendments to the bill. We hope we can reach an agreement and avoid filing cloture on the bill. If there's no further business for the Senate, I, I ask that it adjourn under the previous order. The Senate stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. tomorrow.